Thanks, Nigel. A very good evening, everyone. To what may be potentially one of the most boring talk titles ever. Uh, in the college, we often talk together about what we're maybe doing on, on Sunday and where we're going to preach. And I was talking to some of the guys and saying, I'm going to Castlereagh Fellowship. You know, they have me along from time to time, which is lovely. And I'm going to be speaking in the intertestamental period. And a few eyebrows raised. D did you choose to speak to them? <laughs> we all know that it's thanks to Nigel that we have this <clears throat> to think about together this evening. But I hope and pray that despite the title, the content of what we're going to look at, I hope and pray that it will be edifying for us. Because in so many ways, what we're looking at this evening is the fact that our God is a God who writes history in advance. He stands completely sovereign over it, and he steers it according to his own good purposes. So that, in the language of Galatians 4, when the times had reached their fulfillment, at that time, in the first century, God sent forth his Son for our salvation. So I'm going to pray, ask the Lord to help us, and then I'm going to read from Daniel chapter 8. So let's pray together. Our Father, we praise you that you are indeed the Lord of history. And we pray that as we consider centuries of history this evening, that we would see your hand over it all, guiding and directing, preparing this world for the time when you would send your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, please give us minds that understand, and then please, above all, impress upon us who you are as our great God and King, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So Daniel chapter 8, as a chapter which serves as a great example for us as to how God, before any of these events took place, through his prophet Daniel, set out the great contours of what was going to happen. This is God's word. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. And I saw in the vision, and when I saw, I was in Susa, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was at Ulai, Canal. I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram charging westward, and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram with the two horns which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then the goat became exceedingly great. But when he was strong, the great horn was broken and instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. 
Out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. It grew great, even to the host of heaven. And some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of the sanctuary was overthrown. And a host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offerings because of transgression. And it will throw truth to the ground, and it will act and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Ulai, and it called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. He said, behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the later end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia. And the goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. As for that horn that was broken, in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. And at the later end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limits, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles shall arise, his power shall be great, but not by his own power, and he shall cause fearful destruction, and shall succeed in what he does, and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and in his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that have been told is true, but seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. Amen. The Old Testament ends at dusk. It ends at dusk before what in effect is a period of nightfall and before the time comes when the new day eventually dawns. So if you think about the history of the Old Testament, the people go to Babylon, the exile then comes to an end, many of them return to the land, but at that time, the sun is starting to set. It's falling in the sky, waiting for the time when 
in the fullness of time, the new day would dawn with the coming of Jesus Christ. And God prepared his people for this night before it actually happened. He did it through the prophet Daniel, amongst others, and we've read part of Daniel's preparation there, telling the people this message of what was going to take place. One of the other famous ways of describing this in the prophecy of Daniel is that great statue. Do you remember Nebuchadnezzar had the dream? He was so troubled by it. He didn't want the wise men just telling him any old answer after the fact that they could read back into history. He said, you need to tell me both the dream and its interpretation. And Daniel was the only one given wisdom by God who could go before Nebuchadnezzar and say, King, you saw this great statue, an enormous statue made of gold and silver and bronze and iron and iron and clay. And then in your dream, that statue was smashed into pieces by a rock, which then grew to become a great mountain. And Daniel didn't simply give Nebuchadnezzar the content of the dream, he also explained its meaning and significance. King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian emperor, was the great golden head. And three empires would come after his. The silver chest of this statue, the Medo-Persian empire, the middle and thighs of bronze was the Greek empire in its different forms, an empire that would rule over all the earth. And then lastly, there would be a kingdom which would be as strong as iron. And yet in the end, it would prove to be unstable because this statue had fragile feet of clay. It really was incredible. It was 600 years of history told in advance. It was, as Daniel says, something all about the God who changes the times and the seasons, the one who reigns over it all. Well, when we get to the close of the Old Testament, the Babylonian Empire, it's gone, and the Persian Empire, it is dominant. And the Persian Empire really had become vast. Um, its great leader was Cyrus. There's um, a kind of stone relief of Cyrus, and then someone's kind of given you a reconstruction of what it would have looked like before the weather had aged it. Cyrus became king in 559, and he was the one who allowed the Babylonian exiles to return home to the Promised Land. Here's the Cyrus Cylinder. You can see it in the British Museum. It's an edict from Cyrus, which, amongst other things, gives the Jewish people permission to pack up in Babylon and go back across the desert and to go home. Back in the Promised Land, life was hard and difficult. The people were often discouraged. But in time, the walls of Jerusalem were built under Ezra and Nehemiah. And then a generation later, in 515, 516, the second temple was built by Zerubbabel. And there's a reconstruction from the ESV study Bible, which shows you what Zerubbabel's temple probably looked like. That's during the time of Haggai and Zechariah. And then around the year 400, the voice of the prophets came to an end. And there would be four centuries of prophetic silence until the coming of John the Baptist. And since there was no prophetic voice between the time of Malachi and John, it's often referred to as a period of silent years. But in what we'll see this evening, those years were anything but silent because they were years of incredible turmoil. They were far from quiet. During this time, the Persian Empire expanded, particularly out to the west. I hope you can catch that on the map there and see the way in which it spreads out. It spreads out across to the east, especially, but when it comes to its spread to the west, there it encounters 
really stubborn resistance. Because the Greeks managed to stop the westward expansion of the Persians under Darius at a battle that everyone will have heard of, I'm sure, the Battle of Marathon in 490. In one sense, not a very big battle, but one of those battles of such lasting significance that even if we don't know the specifics of it, we've all heard of the Battle of Marathon. Now, the whole story of Pheidippides running just over 26 miles is probably the conflation of several different stories and one which turned out to be an incredibly shrewd marketing pan for the modern Olympic Games. <laughs> but the battle itself, really significant. The Greeks were massively outnumbered. They were poorly equipped, but they were highly disciplined free men, and they prevailed. But no Greek could have doubted that Marathon, for all its symbolic importance, was not the end of the matter, and that soon the Persians would be back, only this time with a far greater invasion force. And 10 years after Marathon, the Persians arrived. They arrived into Greece, and they burned down the seemingly invincible city of Athens. Even the Acropolis, uh, the ruins of the Parthenon on top of that, we'll talk about what that is in a few minutes, but the, the Acropolis itself, the great sort of stronghold of Athens, the Persians came and they burned it down. But unexpectedly, the Greeks triumphed at the Sea Battle of Salamis, a great naval encounter, and that was followed up by another great land battle at Plataea in 479. Again, making that point, free men are far more motivated soldiers than those who are simply conscripts. And the aftermath of those battles at which the Persians were defeated ushered in a golden age for Athens. A great golden age for the Greek cities of the fifth century. So if you think of Socrates and Plato, if you think of the Parthenon on top of the Acropolis, that's all coming from this golden age of the fifth century. A time of philosophy, democracy, poetry, theater, architecture, and sculpture. There was something like a cold war going on between the Greeks and the Persians at this time. Not really that many um, hot wars. And it was a time in which there was great advances in so many areas of culture in the Greek city-states. Internal fighting between Athens and the other great Greek city of Sparta allowed Philip of Macedon the opportunity to turn North Greece into a powerful military machine. So Philip of Macedon, the leader of the Macedonians, he and his people, they really came into their own at this time. And he was getting ready to launch a mission to invade Persia, partly motivated by revenge, partly motivated by ambition. He didn't get to do it because he was assassinated by one of his personal bodyguards, but his son, aged 20, took the throne and he did it. His son was Alexander and his name will be known to all of us this evening because his son was Alexander the Great. Alexander had been tutored by the great philosopher Aristotle. He had an intense love and interest in Greek language and literature and philosophy and culture and tradition. And like his teacher Aristotle, Alexander's plan was unity. He wanted to integrate all things together under his rule. And he took the throne. He subdued the Greek city-states, and then he turned his attention to Persia. He knew that that great world empire, 
as vast as it was, was nowhere as strong as it appeared. And he turned the Greeks into a fighting machine ready to conquer the world. Um, once Greek was, Greece was at his feet, in 334 BC, he crossed the Hellespont, the Dardanelles, in order to penetrate into Asia Minor. Alexander's troops destroyed the Persians at Issus in 333. There he is, riding out in a mosaic from that time. Eventually he took Tyre after a long siege. When he took it, the Greeks crucified 2,000 men from Tyre and they sold 30,000 of them into slavery. Alexander's feet hardly touched the ground in all of this. He pushed into Egypt. He was crowned Pharaoh. Jerusalem submitted to him without a fight. In 331, he took Babylon, and the Persian king Darius III was assassinated by his own men. He pushed way, way east, reaching as far as India. And when he got there, he is said to have wept because there were no more worlds left to conquer. As Daniel had predicted, Greece had grown to be a significant empire. The male goat that destroyed the ram with the two asymmetrical horns. That was Medo-Persia. The ram of Medo-Persia had one horn that was bigger than the others because the Persian part of that empire was far stronger than the other. And the Medo-Persian empire, as Daniel tells us in verse four, went west and north and south. But eventually it was challenged by a power that came. And Gabriel tells us in verse 21 that that power was Greece. It was one conspicuous horn, Alexander the Great, verse 21. He pushed west with great intensity and speed. He conquered the known world. He advanced so quickly that it seemed as if his feet did not touch the ground. It's great lessons for us to learn even from this. If you think of the way in which the Lord reveals this, first of all, through Daniel, these great nations, these superpowers of the day, what are they like in this vision? They're like medium-sized animals. Yes, they are dangerous. Yes, they can be vicious. But these are animals that the divine shepherd can drive whichever way he wants as he wills. And he calls time in them. He raises them up. And then in time, he brings them down. God doesn't just tell history in advance. He controls the whole thing. And so with Alexander, the one who rose to significance and prominence and who conquered everything in a matter of just a few years, he was struck down at the very height of his power in Babylon, aged only 33. And quite possibly he died simply from malaria. And with him died the dream of uniting one vast empire of East and West under Greek language and culture. And without Alexander the Great's towering genius, that massive empire that he had conquered, it would never hold together. Back in Daniel 8, Daniel's given the vision of the great horn of the male goat that suddenly struck, and then verses 8 and 22, four lesser horns grow up in four directions. And the kingdom, the great Greek kingdom, it eventually is divided in four among Alexander's generals. And two of his most important successors were the Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt and the Seleucid dynasty in Syria and beyond. So up there you can see all the areas that Alexander the Great conquered 
in just his 33 years of life, the whole way across into India. His feet hardly touched the ground in all of it. It's the way that Daniel describes it. And then he was cut down. And in this next map, you can see the four horns, the successors that came after Alexander the Great, and the two that we're going to be particularly interested in is the one which is colored orange in the area of Egypt, of the Ptolemies, and then also the one in green, the Seleucid or the Syrian Empire. We'll think about this particularly from the point of view of Israel and what's going on there. Because at first, after Alexander the Great, the center of gravity for the control of Israel shifted to Egypt. And in Egypt, the Ptolemies hold sway. And the Ptolemies are not expansionist. Their main aim was to preserve their rule and authority in Egypt. They had strong centralized government from their capital of Alexandria in Egypt. And Judea was peacefully accepted under Ptolemaic rule, and the people there were given relative stability and wealth. Samaria didn't fare as well. Samaria became a Greek garrison, and that meant that the Samaritans became focused on a new settlement at Mount Gerizim. So if you know John 4 and the discussion that takes place with the woman at the well, and she raises the question about which mountain to worship on, she talks about the Samaritans. We have our mountain, Mount Gerizim. That all dates from this time. Up on the screen now, <clears throat> you're seeing an image, a reconstruction of the great city of Alexandria on the north coast of Egypt, um, one of the great metropolises of the ancient world. Here you can see one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the great lighthouse of Alexandria. Alexandria also famous for its library at this time, which contained hundreds of thousands of pieces in its collection. It was an intellectual and cultural center for the Jewish world. And many Jewish people were brought to Alexandria. And it was there in Egypt in the third and second centuries that the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek. A translation of the Bible called the Septuagint. It was a translation of the Bible prepared for Jews who understood Greek better than Hebrew. And all of that matters to us because this translation of the Bible from Hebrew into Greek called the Septuagint was in so many ways the Bible of the early church. Lots and lots of the quotations that we have in the New Testament, their Old Testament quotations drawn from the Septuagint, that translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek. Now, the dominance of the Ptolemies wouldn't last because the power of the Syrian Seleucids grew. Seleucus was another general of Alexander the Great, and he received Syria. He founded Syrian Antioch in around the year 300 BC, and he made it his capital. Antioch in Syria is another one of those places that is known to Bible readers of the New Testament because it was that great center of the early missionary work of the church. And it's founded by Seleucus, this general of Alexander the Great. As the dominance of the Ptolemies wanes and as <clears throat> the Seleucids grow in power, Jerusalem finds itself really being dominated by a series of wars between these two rival empires who want control of their important land bridge. And unlike the Ptolemies, the Seleucids really were expansionist. They thought 
that they were the true heirs of Alexander the Great. And they wanted to try to unite the whole world under Greek culture. And by the time of the rule of Antiochus II in 223 BC, the area which was under Seleucid control was vast. It extended from um, Persia to the shores of the Aegean Sea. It took in Mesopotamia and Asia Minor. Absolutely massive. It seemed as if they were ruling the entire world. Now, the constant battles between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies for control of the land, it ceased when Ptolemy V lost control to Antiochus III in 198 BC. And Syrian control over Israel only lasted for about 30 years, but it was one of the most difficult periods for Jewish people. We might say that at this time, Israel entered into the very valley of the shadow of death, especially when this man, Antiochus IV, took the throne in 176. He called himself Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus the Glorious One, and he believed that he was a manifestation of Zeus. And his reign led to an intense period of anti-Jewish campaign. The Seleucid Empire was the horn that had grown exceedingly great towards the south, toward the east, and verse nine, toward the glorious land. And toward the end of the Seleucid rule, according to Gabriel, verse 23, a king of bold face would arise. 1 verse 24, who would cause fearful destruction. And under that man, that is exactly what took place in Jerusalem. Antiochus' forces entered the holy place of the temple. They removed the menorah and the golden altar. They stopped the regular sacrifices. They ordered Jewish people not to keep the law. The observance of the Sabbath the practice of circumcision and the possession of the Hebrew scriptures, all of those things were judged to be capital crimes deserving death. And many people compromised. Many people in the land sacrificed to the idols and broke the law. They became fully cooperative Greek citizens of the Seleucid Empire. But those who would not heed Antiochus' decrees and who clung on to their faith in the face of terrible persecution found many of their number martyred and put to death. All of this reached absolute fever pitch in the year 168 when Antiochus dedicated Zerubbabel's temple in Jerusalem to the god Zeus. He erected an idolatrous statue of Zeus in the temple, and he sacrificed the flesh of pigs on an altar that was built there. And all of this was fiercely resisted by a small group of Jews who did everything in their power to preserve their faith and their culture. They were called the Hasidians or the pious ones. And their revolt began when a Seleucid emissary traveled to a small village northwest of Jerusalem. And he went there in order to compel the villagers to sacrifice to a pagan god and to shun the teaching of the law. An old priest by the name Mattathias responded with Phineas-like zeal. And this was the opening act in a prolonged struggle for freedom. Mattathias and his sons engaged in a guerrilla war against Antiochus with the help of Hasidian warriors. These people lived in caves in the wilderness 
And they went out and they tore down pagan altars. They rescued copies of the Hebrew scriptures. They killed collaborators and invaders. And Mattathias died shortly after the revolt started, but his son Judas, nicknamed Maccabeus, which means something like Judas the Hammer or Judah the Hammerhead, he was the one who led this revolt against the Seleucids, and he became a national hero. He fought so ably that they liberated Jerusalem. The Temple Mount was cleansed and rededicated, and this was in the year 164, three years after the sacrilege under Antiochus. And the celebration of Ophet lasted eight days and became known as the Feast of Dedication, a feast which Jews still keep to this day in December, Hanukkah, and a feast which is known about in the gospel because Jesus went up to celebrate it in John chapter 10. Judas became governor. There he is leading the troops out. And his family were known as the Hasmoneans. They set out to gain political independence, which came to them in the year 142. And if you just think about it, it was a stunning achievement for a resistance movement fighting against the superpower of the day from an operation in the hill country in Israel. As for Antiochus, he was, Daniel 8, 25, broken but by no human hand, dying of a mysterious internal illness in 164. Now these Hasmoneans who liberated Jerusalem were great and wise men, but the same cannot be said for their descendants who became progressively dictatorial, corrupt, and immoral. And it was during this time, during the time of the Hasmoneans, that three different parties came to emerge within Judaism, some of which you will definitely have heard of. The Pharisees, the Essenes, and the Sadducees. Now, the Pharisees were the successors of the Hasidians, those pious ones, the people who fought alongside Judas Maccabeus. They had joined him in his revolt against the Seleucids and against their Hellenizing influence. The Pharisees, their name means the separated ones, and in all of this, they were scrupulous about keeping the law. The Essenes also appear to have originated with the Hasidians, and they believed that the Hasmonean dynasty was apostate and corrupt, and so they withdrew to the desert. And some of their number may have founded the community at Qumran, which wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then at this time, in the second century, the Sadducees also emerge, a group that we read about all the time in the Gospels. And the Sadducees were the liberal aristocracy, a group associated in so many ways with the Hasmoneans themselves, an elite group with considerable power. And the Hasmoneans continued to exercise rule through an alliance with Rome, which was now the new superpower of the day. In the first century BC, a dispute broke out between two brothers in the Hasmonean dynasty about who would take the throne. And in Israel, civil war broke out and the Jews appealed to the Romans to come and to arbitrate in the dispute in order to restore harmony. The Hasmoneans refused Rome's recognition and so in 62 BC, the Roman general came, the Roman general Pompey came, he invaded Israel, and he turned it into a Roman client state. And that began a time of deep suspicion and ill will towards Rome that lasted right on into the New Testament era. Pompey tried to rule through the Hasmoneans, but as you can imagine, that didn't work out. 
And so Pompey decided that he wouldn't stick with the status quo, but instead he divided the Hasmonean kingdom into two areas, Galilee to the north and Judea in the south. And then in 37 BC, the Romans made Herod king of the Jews, controlling the territory that included Judea and Galilee and Samaria. And Herod himself was the grandson of an Idumean. That means that he was an Edomite who traced his family line from Esau rather than from Jacob. And the Jews were therefore very reluctant to accept Herod as their king. None of this helped by the fact that Herod was a cruel and paranoid man. Something that we know fits exactly with the New Testament record because Herod, of course, was the one who tried to put to death all the baby boys in Bethlehem. Herod had at least five wives, and such was his cruelty, even to his family, that Caesar Augustus is reported to have said it would be better to have been Herod's pig than his son because Herod refused to eat pork. He didn't want to offend his Jewish subjects, but he had no aversions to killing his own children. His reign was filled with intrigue, with plots, with murder and brutality. Now, initially, Herod's major threat came from Mark Anthony, who had close ties to the Ptolemies in Egypt, under the rule of someone else that you'll know of, Queen Cleopatra. And when that challenge ended, Herod's reign entered an era of great peace. And during this time, he rebuilt Samaria. Up on the screen, he constructed a great aqueduct to bring fresh water to Caesarea. When he gained control of Jericho from Cleopatra, He built a winter palace for himself in Jericho, including this massive swimming pool in which one of his own sons was drowned. Herod strengthened the hilltop fortress of Masada, but by far his greatest building project was in Jerusalem himself. He built a great palace complex at the Herodian south of Jerusalem, and he expanded the temple really significantly. Little remains of that temple today, except part of what you can see here, the huge retaining wall built to enlarge the temple area so that it would stretch out to some 36 acres. A hugely impressive golden structure. As John 2.20 tells us, the building project to remodel the temple had taken 46 years and still was incomplete. And then the New Testament opens during the days of the Roman Empire, the time when the Lord would send his rock to set up his kingdom. The stone would make its mark during the time of the Roman Empire. And this rejected stone would become the very cornerstone in the living temple that God was building. The glorious stone of Jesus Christ would begin by being very small, but it would grow to fill the whole earth and endure forever. And unlike those other kingdoms that we've thought about this evening, which came and then went, which rose up and then were passed on to others, this kingdom of Jesus Christ will never be destroyed or handed on to others. It will continue to grow until at last, The kingdom is consummated at the time when the knowledge of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So God writes history in advance and God prepares the world for the fullness of time when he would send forth his son, born of the woman. God had prepared the world by giving one language that people understood across so much of it the language of Greek, the common Greek that the New Testament was written in, that great missionary language of the early church. He prepared the world 
by bringing about so much that the peace that the Romans helped to establish, Roman roads that meant that the gospel could go out, Roman peace and law, which meant that there was freedom to be able to proclaim the good news. God had orchestrated all things so that his son would come and be born at just the right time. So a period of silence, and yet a period in which God is preparing all things for the coming of the word and for the prophetic word to be spoken out through John the Baptist and through the incarnate word himself, Jesus Christ.